Paddy is STSM Chief Architect of Watson Care Manager Development at IBM Watson Health. He's an expert in the architecture and design of enterprise business applications, working across software as a service and on-premise solutions in healthcare and government. Paddy will use a software as a service offering example to illustrate how the open agile architecture practices such as continuous architectural refactoring can guide an as a service transformation. And uh, please let's go to uh, play Paddy's video and keep those questions coming in for the panel. Hi. I'm Paddy Fagan from IBM Watson Health, and I'm going to talk about our experience creating a SaaS offering and how the practices we put into place helped us in doing that uh, and the challenges we faced and how those map onto what we've described in the open agile architecture. And um, hopefully, you know, by illustrating this with an example, it kind of helps put it in context for people. Obviously, you know, there's a challenge here in that my example is not your example, but hopefully by talking through it, there's something of my example that will be helpful to you and sort of use something you can recognize in that. Um, so one day, some time ago, my VP asked us a question. He said, how about we take our large monolithic application and make a subset of the features available to smaller customers? Now, that's not a question. That's not a surprise. Anybody who's familiar with dealing with these kind of situations will be used to that and, and, and will recognize in that a, a world they're used to. And um, obviously there's also some unknowns in there, you know, what's a smaller customer? Uh, well, we're not really sure yet. We'll figure that out kind of questions. And um, there were, of course, unfortunately for us, other questions as well. So, you know, it needed to be available as a service with low hosting costs. It needed to be in production really fast because there was competitors. It needed to um, have deep functional value because that was really important for the marketplace. It needed to be suitable for HIPAA data and GDPR in the EU. Um, Consequent with that are all sorts of risks to the organization about fines and imprisonment for various executives and so on, none of which anybody wants to entertain. Um, and it needs to align with our internal compliance rules. And again, I guess, recognizing that in large organizations, that's really important as well, right? There, there's one thing about the externally defined rules, but there's another about the internally defined rules and we've got to be part of that as well. Um, now, again, not surprising anybody who's used to these kind of conversations, there was a final question. Uh, when can I have it? And uh, we were cautiously or not so cautiously reminded that the correct answer was yesterday, failing that as soon as possible. Um, but, you know, these are the, 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 the reasons why we're here and the things we get to take on. So there's this challenge in a good sense in this too. And um, I guess, you know, what I will say is that that's my story. Your story will be different. It won't necessarily be a VP. It'll be some other business owner. It won't necessarily be about taking monolithic applications to as, as a service offerings. It'll be about something else. However, I think there's an element of that exchange, which probably hopefully at least resonates with, with a lot of you, which represents, you know, a lot of people's experience in, in getting faced with these kind of questions and, and, and having to respond to it and what you do. And I guess what we're trying to bring out here today is some of the things that we've described in the open agile architecture and how they relate to what we did and how we made a success of what we did. And um, another way of describing of this is our experience, experience of continuous architectural refactoring. And I guess, you know, there's almost a, a, a step zero before I continue, which says, given what we were asked for and what we were told, the obvious, you know, a thing to draw from that was that we couldn't design our architecture, implement it, and then bring it to the market. There really wasn't time for that. So what we had to do was set ourselves up for a world where we came to the market with an architecture and we evolved it. And then it was about how do we manage that and what were the prerequisites, but also how do we set ourselves up so that we didn't trip over ourselves in, in moving forward. So let's get on to that a little bit. <clears throat> so mirroring the structure of the um, Open Agile Architecture document, the first thing we looked at was, was planning and understanding. And really in that, you know, it's about constraints and constraints are, well, obviously the list of things that we were granted on the first day from our VP, um, but also um, it's about documenting and agree, oh, excuse me, um, which are really important because what you want to do there is, is make sure that all of your stakeholders understand those constraints and accept them. Because one of the biggest things that we've seen go wrong in our experience is where constraints are misunderstood or misaligned. And, and stakeholders have expectations that people feel they can't meet because of constraints. And, um, you know, uh, from uh, Rosancy and Woods talk about come up with the limits and constraints within, within which you work to ratify these with your stakeholders. And to me, that's the key here, right? It's not just about, 
you know, everybody knows that we have to do X or we can't do Y. It's about writing that down and getting everybody bought into that from the get go. And fitness functions, really powerful part of this from our experience about getting those really executable tests for non-functional requirements and that ability to know that at any one point in time our non-functionals are satisfied because these fitness functions are passing some days you may decide that you know we'll, we'll live with breaking one of them for a while but you do that in a knowledgeable way based on an understanding of what the value is what it should be and what you're choosing to do for how long and why and the final piece is guardrails and that's really about lightweight governance right it's about empowering the individual groups teams architects whoever they are, depending on the scale of your organization and your project, to do things, to make decisions and to move forward with the minimum of oversight. Right? You, they need oversight, they need to make the right decisions in the right context, and they need to understand all of those things. Um, but, but you don't want everybody to be involved in all the decisions or, or you're gonna tie yourself in a million different knots. And I guess with guardrails, what you're trying to say is, here's things that we are assuming you're gonna do, is not quite the right word, but we expect you to do. If you're doing the things we expect you to do, you document that you're doing them and you proceed. If you hit a point where you can't do one of the things we expect because of some constraint that you're facing, then come and talk to us, explain the constraint you're facing, the decisions you've made and what you've chosen to do, and we'll figure it out, right? We'll either go, yeah, you're right, or we go, no, we don't think you should really do it that way, or we'll amend the constraints or whatever it might be. But, you know, those things are really important, right? Because they're they're that double-edged thing, right? By stating what you can do, you empower people to do it rather than stating what they can't do, which tends to disempower people. And that's really, in my mind at least, the way guardrails you know, can and should be structured for success. So moving on from that initial phase of figuring out what you're gonna do and what sort of parameters you're gonna place on it, we've got creating the right technical environment. And I guess this is where a lot of us you know, hit our, our stride. This is in a, a, a sort of, a pitch we're very used to, the sort of thing that we're very used to doing in our day-to-day our -day lives or, or, or um, businesses. You know, for us in this kind of world, continuous architectural factoring, you know, open agile style, there's really a couple of key things here, right? Continuous delivery, being able to release everything all the time. One of these things it's really easy to say, it's not so easy to live it. If you live it from the start and it becomes part of what you do, the DNA of your project, then it just is and it works and it's there. The problem with it is sometimes it can be very easy to go, oh, well, it's actually kind of hard to do that right now. We'll just forego that for a little bit and suddenly it slips and it slides and it never quite comes back and that's a real challenge, but it's something that has to be part of that. And certainly from our experience, it really does. Feature toggles, you know, that ability uh, to um, switch things off, switch things off because they don't work and you want to roll them back, switch them off because the performance management um, you know, complications have come up and you need to change the system characteristics. System, uh, switch things off because uh, you've got service related problems, be it circuit breakers or whatever else have gone off and you need to switch things off because the underlying services aren't available. Again, another thing that it's very easy to say, but it's harder to live, right? And, and living it requires a, a sort of mindset that lets you build things that way, but test them that way and run them that way and, and do it and yet not you know, die a death of having a, a product that has you know, millions of different potential configurations with different things on and off that nobody can ever be certain what the net effect of switching the flicking the switches in a particular way is, right? So a, a real challenge, but a really powerful thing and something that you know, really sets you up for success. Componentization, and I guess certainly in our world, because of, you know, we started with this monolithic application at the start, in really important, right? That and, and for me, the message here is one of just because you start with a monolith, you don't have to end up with one or stay with it forever. Uh, you're not married to the monolith. Um, you know, and there the real power in this is the ability to say, we're gonna take this thing, we're gonna use it because it's got a lot of value, but we're gonna put a strangler on front of it or whatever other structures or patterns you choose, and then gradually chip away and make good decisions about how you're going to attack that over time and what the business returns for those attacks are and as you'll see in the next slide there's a bit more about that sort of stuff but how you go on that journey right it's not about setting out on day one and saying well we're going to spend six months or a year or whatever it is taking this thing apart and putting it back together again it certainly wasn't for us it was certainly not the, the structure of our project so we we had to build this in as a an environment that we knew we were going to be living with some time and it was going to be evolving for some time and then 
the final piece of this, uh, you know, from my perspective, and, and again, as it's described in the uh, open agile architecture, is creating the wrong right non-technical environment. And again, sometimes this is one, you know, that people like myself and, and possibly some of you tend to shy away from a little bit, right? This is a little bit more salesy on one side, a little bit more org on the other side, maybe it's a little bit of politics. But but again, success relies on these things, and so it becomes really important, right? So the first one is justifying that ongoing investment in architectural refactoring. I guess what we're really getting at there from our perspective is that idea that although everybody accepts the constraints at the start and the decisions you're making, you need to have that roadmap because that has to be the reminder for all of those future dates where you're going to have separate discussions and go, well, we need to do this now, or we need to pay back this particular debt or invest in next to do Y and have that laid out, have it laid out, not just with the technical pieces, but also with the business returns, you know, whether that is in terms of flexibility or additional functionality or improved developer productivity or however it may be defined. But the act of writing that down and ordering it and organizing it is incredibly powerful. It's one that's really powerful for your stakeholders in terms of getting their buy-in. It's very useful to be able to reproduce it and at a certain point down the road as well. But it's also valuable for the development teams to see that, you know, we're making short-term decisions, but that doesn't mean we're stuck with them and, and that we have a, a path forward. That really then turns into that architectural roadmap, right? And, and I guess for me, with this, you always make these plans knowing they're going to change. And that's okay, because, because you make the best decision you can on the day and make them. But what you want is that sort of um, touchstone or guiding light or waypoint that you're aiming for and say, this is where we want to go. We're going to do X. And that takes us towards it, maybe slightly away in a different direction, moving in the right direction. Then we're going to do Y and then Z. And maybe along the way, we change our minds about what those are. And that, that obviously impacts, you know, the justifying your ongoing investment as well and you make different business decisions but without those waypoints or guiding lights it's very hard right because it becomes a point thing of we're going to do x for y and maybe that's the right thing but maybe it doesn't take you quite the right direction or what is the trade-off and i guess you know for me those two first pieces really come together to create those guiding documents or touchstones or, or visions that help you inform what you're doing and make the right decisions going forward that's incredibly powerful and progressive transformation you know it's really about getting everybody involved and um, in figuring out what's good enough at every point in the journey you know perfect's never going to be there for for lots of projects and um, good enough has to be good enough and and the question then becomes how do you test that what is the how do people decide for themselves what that is how do they describe that to others how is that trade-off played out how do you do that at every point in the journey, knowing that the variations are going to kick in as we execute on our roadmap and, and make different investment decisions? And again, you know, it's about creating that, that information up front, not because it's cast in stone or isn't going to change, but rather so that it can inform the decision going forward. And then the final one, I suspect, is both kind of, you know, something people are very aware of, but something sometimes it's very hard to do, which is inverse Conway which is, you know, to say, well, if our architecture is going to be influenced by our team structure, let's set up the team structure for the architecture that we want to get to. Um, it's easily said, it, it's harder to achieve, but it, it is incredibly powerful if it's done. It's something that we found incredibly powerful. And um, it's something that, um, you know, we've seen in other places do the same. And I guess that sort of takes me to the end of my, my few slides about this. I guess what, you know, what I've tried to bring out here is, is we went on a real journey with some real, if, somewhat troubling requests at the start. And we did these things, we didn't necessarily know as we did them what the right phraseology or the right way to describe them. You know, that's something that's come in over time, but we really feel that we've we've built the way forward and, and done the right things. And that what we've done in our contribution to the open agile architecture is to describe that and make that available to other people. And hopefully it's useful to you and others as well. Okay, thank you very much. First question I have for you, Patty is actually about one of the last things you spoke about, and you 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 did a a, a great job. It's uh, the inverse Conway maneuver. Can you maybe take a step back about what that is, and 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 uh, one of the things you said was it's immensely valuable if it's done right. But um, can you can you uh, take a step back to explain what it is and uh, and uh, what the value is? Sure, Steve. So. I guess the first thing to say is Conway's law is a concept, hopefully most people are familiar with it, maybe not, which says that ultimately your software architecture or indeed your enterprise architecture ends up 
um, mirroring your organization structure. And you can, you can argue about whether you feel that's true or not, but unfortunately the general experience is that's what happens. So inverse Conway is that ability to step back from that and say, well, if our organization structure is going to influence our architecture and we know what the architecture we desire is, how about we set up our organization structure in advance to mirror the architecture we want to achieve? And, right. and I guess, you know, the, the trick with, as I, I alluded to in the video with doing it right, is around that idea of saying, well, you know, you're never going to be perfect, right? If your architectural uh, vision has 56 components, you're never going to get 56 teams with just the right composition. That's very unlikely to work at an organizational level. But it may well be that you could say, well, these subcomponents we can hand to these teams over here, and these subcomponents can go here, and that kind of thing. And that's really where you know inverse Conway kind of comes to life, I guess. And and is that something that that you know is a um, is a sort of scale thing? Is it is it something that's that's more more important in a larger organization, or is it something you should have in mind in a, even even a smaller organization? Yeah, I think it's interesting, Steve. I think I think you could argue it affects both. And I think perhaps in a large organization, it's probably quite clear cut, right? Because you've got very large groups of people coming together and you other pressures. So if you don't act, something will happen. But actually, you know, taking a step back and, and sort of stepping back into my early career, I, I worked for a startup for many years. And in a small organization, you're you're almost more uh, susceptible to it without ever realizing that. In, a, in an organization of 20 people and you randomly form into squads to go and address different problems, it's oh so easy for each randomly you know, formed squad or, or, or a dynamically formed squad to create their own component or repository or architectural structure and then just seed that to the rest of the team. And you end up with, with, a, you know, with, with a, a version of that sort of run riot where as the organization has transformed itself every month or two, your architecture is getting read for the background without anybody ever, you know, taking a step back and going, oh, I'm not quite sure this is the direction we want to go. So right. And right. I think it's one of those things you're 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 subject to no matter where you are in the world, whether you choose to act on it and you know do things like inverse conway is a different question. But I think everybody's subject to it whether they know it or not. That's right. Yeah, I mean, uh, I'll I'll give a shameless plug at this point for one of our other standards in the open group for the uh, the uh, digital practitioner body of knowledge, which which kind of has this uh, emergence model concept and and addresses uh, the types of things you need to be thinking about at different stages of uh, of an organization's evolution. Um, very much uh, sitting very nicely with what you talked about. You know, it's uh, there's a there's a certain point in time when uh, other things become uh, much more important, but arguably they're there from the, from the beginning. So, anyway, Paddy, we're gonna we're gonna move on and save uh, some other questions for you on the panel. So don't go away, um, and uh, we will see you again soon. In the meantime, thanks very much.